like standby because we are about to get taxed even more and interest rates are gonna go up even more. And one of these predictions was like 40% of your paycheck is gonna go to interest rates. Basically, if the United States doesn't get our shit together within two decades, we're gonna be fucked to the point of no return. I'm Stephanie Keith. And I am Tara Manjekovic. And we are unapologetically outspoken. Hey, everybody. Happy Monday. And let's see what's going on today. Well, Congress, uh, still a completely dysfunctional shit show. And we still have no House Speaker. So if you haven't been paying attention, Jim Jordan failed in the third round of voting on Friday. And then there was a plan to give uh, Speaker Pro Tempore Patrick McHenry, basically like give him more powers for the next several months so that at least the House could resume doing business. But then that didn't happen either. And so now we're going on, what is it now? Two weeks, over two weeks with no House Speaker. And after Jim Jordan lost his third voting session, I think it was 86 to 112, the House decided to just take the rest of the weekend off. So after Friday shit show, they're like, we're done until Monday. And meanwhile, we continue to look like a clown show to the rest of the world, which is a sentiment echoed by House Foreign Affairs Committee Chair Rep. Michael McCall. He stated, quote, we're living in a dangerous world. The world is on fire. Our adversaries are watching what we do. And quite frankly, they like it, end quote. And honestly, I'd have to agree with that. And I wouldn't be surprised if world leaders were literally sitting around eating popcorn, watching the U.S. shit show continue to unfold. And as Stephanie and I have said many times on this podcast, this Congress shit show does nothing but highlight how fractured the Republican Party is. And political strategist Brian Seitchik uh, did an interview with the Epic Times recently, and he said, quote, it is absolutely hurting us. We should be talking about Joe Biden's failures. Republicans disagree on some things, but we all uniformly agree that Joe Biden has been an abject failure for this country, bad for taxpayers, bad for those who want a secure border. He's been a failure on so many fronts, and yet we're focused on our own internal civil war. It's going to adversely impact us next year as we head into the 2024 campaign. How can we, with a straight face, make the case that Joe Biden has failed in his job when the one part of the government the Republicans do control, we can't even open up for business, end quote. I mean, you can't argue that, right? No. And I also read that Republican, the Republicans that did vote against Jim Jordan have been receiving death threats. They've had their families threatened. And there's this recent survey that came out. It was done by Yahoo News and YouGov. And it showed that Americans are starting to increasingly blame Republicans more than Democrats for the dysfunction in Congress. There was a survey conducted uh, last week from October 12th to the 16th. It was approximately 1,700 adults that were surveyed, and 68% of voters now say that conservative Republicans deserve some of the blame for the current gridlock in Washington, and 64% say that moderate Republicans are also to blame. So again, it's clear the Republican Party is totally fucking itself. And we're going to see what happens with this because apparently several new candidates are throwing their hats in the ring. Uh, tonight, there's going to be a GOP conference at 6.30 p.m. So far, we've got Kevin Hearn from Oklahoma, Austin Scott from Georgia, Tom Emmer from Minnesota, Jack Bergman from Michigan, Pete Sessions from Texas, and Byron Donalds from Florida. These guys have already stated that they're running. And then several others are thinking about it, apparently, including Ron Muser from Pennsylvania, Jody Arrington from Texas, and Mike Johnson from Louisiana. And McHenry thinks that we'll have a new House Speaker by the end of the week. And that makes me laugh, because based on the way that things have been going, I highly doubt they're going to get their shit together enough to agree on someone. No, with that many people throwing their name in, it's going to yeah. be a shit show throughout the rest of the year. Like, this is absolutely ridiculous i don't even recognize half of those names right. like they're yeah. they haven't made a name for themselves yet um and i think you're right in what you said and like the next time the house is up for re-election like people are not going to choose republicans when mm -hmm. they're getting nothing done i mean they could get a lot done right now and yeah they've like started launching investigations but nothing 
substantial has come from it yet. Yeah. Um, so Matt Gates and the other seven Republicans that ousted Kevin McCarthy, they held a press conference where they even offered to be censured or even removed from the House if it meant that the Republicans would come together and vote for Jim Jordan so Congress could resume. And like these fucking idiots still wouldn't do it. It's like here they're saying like, OK, you know, they're basically saying like maybe we fucked up and we will take the blame for that and, you know, just get things moving. And they still wouldn't do it. And I had um, I I have always liked Jim Jordan. Um but I heard on one of the uh, news programs that he's known as like the second most popular Republican just across the entire country. So that tells me that a lot of the constituents of these Republicans probably would love to have someone like him in there and their member or representative voted no. And I just think that we we deserve like an answer to why. Like if you're going to vote no for him, like can we know why? What what is the reason for that? I think they owe that to their constituents and to really the whole country because it's um, I think he would have been a great clean candidate to put in there that's not bought. Um, and so I think that this is the uniparty at play and they are going to protect themselves instead of doing what their constituents wanted, because I think if you do get someone like Jim Jordan in there, it really starts to expose some of the uniparty that just basically votes Democrat because they've been bought and paid for. Like, that's my theory. But I also think it's interesting that what when McCarthy finally got the position, it was like 17 rounds or something that they went through before they agreed on him. And like Jim Jordan, it was what, three, three. And they're like, okay, mm -hmm. we're done. And then, yeah. like you said, I don't know who uh, three quarters of the people are that are putting in, putting their hat in the ring. Like they're not well known. So I don't know. I think the whole thing is just a, a continuous clown show that just makes us look like we don't have our shit together. And meanwhile, we are like fast approaching this November 17th deadline for approving a budget. So we're going to be facing another possible government shutdown if we don't get a House speaker, not just a House speaker, but if we don't get a House speaker and then get a budget approved, because this continuing resolution is going to run out. And it's like, we already know that our debt is fucking sky high, but I want to give you guys some updates on how bad our deficit has actually become, because there were reports released over the weekend indicating that the United States annual budget deficit has decreased 23% from last year to the tune of being $320 billion higher, bringing the budget deficit to just under $1.7 trillion fucking dollars. And the Washington Times reported that according to the Congressional Budget Office, our deficit actually would have been much worse and would have been closer to $2 trillion if the Supreme Court hadn't overturned Biden's student loan, student debt loan forgiveness program, because apparently that ended up showing a savings of $300 billion in this year's budget. But overall, the federal government collected $4.439 trillion in revenue this past year, but we've spent $6.134 trillion. So that's a final deficit of $1.695 trillion. That was going to be my question. I'm like, with as much as we're taxed and double taxed and triple taxed because there's sales tax and income tax and property tax, how do they not have enough money? But how do you spend over $6 trillion? Yeah, keep throwing money at Ukraine. <laughs> insane. Oh my God. Yeah. And it gets crazier because the latest data from the U.S. Treasury shows that as of October 18th, last week, the total outstanding public debt hit $33.63 trillion, which is roughly $500 billion higher than where it was on the final reporting day less than a month ago in September. And interest payments of government debt have exploded and they have become the single biggest line item increase, coming in at $879.3 billion. Okay, that is almost nine, um, $900 billion just in interest payments, in interest payments, which is fucking insane, or $900 million. Um, at the rate we're going, it is projected 
that we're going to spend more on interest payments than on national defense by 2027. That's what the experts are predicting. And according to the 2024 White House budget, our national debt is expected to surpass $43 trillion by 2033. And with the way this administration spends money, I actually think that's a severe underestimation. So just yeah, just last Friday, Biden announced he's requesting another nearly 106 billion in supplemental funding from Congress. And if you want the full details, you can go on the wh.gov website. It's all there. But I read an article on Yahoo Finance that kind of broke down what the package includes. So it's uh, more than 60 billion to Ukraine, more than 20 billion to the Middle East. 7.5 7.5 billion towards quote China focused efforts. And then we're going to throw in 10 billion for America's southern border. So, like, isn't that nice that we're going to, like, you know, toss a little prize fund towards our border? And National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan is saying that this money is crucial in our efforts to maintain peace and stability in the Indo Pacific region and to help our allies build the capabilities that are necessary to meet their emerging challenges. But then he also indicated that these funds would be spread across the entire region and not exclusive to Taiwan. So we we can give large sums of money exclusively to Ukraine. But other than that, we're just going to spread it around. And Biden gave a speech and he said something about like keeping one eye, at least keeping at least one eye on China. Like the fucker can even see at this point. But like, it is, as usual, it's like all about Ukraine, because Biden also stated in one of his speeches last week, he said, quote, if we walk away and let Putin erase Ukraine's independence, would be aggressors around the world would be emboldened to try the same, end quote. Um, and he said, like, the chaos would spread to the Indo-Pacific and the Middle East. I think that's already happening. Like, yeah, you already opened that can of worms. I don't know if it was that speech or another one, but like the speech was supposed to be on uh, Israel and like our support. And then he ended up talking about Ukraine like almost the whole time and like kept like pairing Ukraine with Israel. I'm like, what are you doing? Like, he's just it's so bad. Well, did you see again, like, well, I think it was Friday, one of his speeches on Friday, he was reading the teleprompter instructions again. (laughs) It was like, of course he was. I mean, I'm surprised he can read the teleprompter at this point. He can barely keep his eyes open. I know. I know. It's, it's, it's absolutely like, yeah. (sighs) Okay. So. Oh, I could go, I could go on and on about that fucking man. Um, but I I did read another article in the Epic Times, and it was referencing a report from the Penn Wharton budget model. And this is concerning, along with everything else, because it estimates that even with a quote, best case scenario, end quote, basically if the United States doesn't get our shit together within two decades, we're gonna be fucked to the point of no return. So the study states, quote, under current policy, the U.S. has about 20 years for corrective action, after which no amount of future tax increases or spending cuts could avoid the government defaulting on its debt, whether explicitly or implicitly, i.e. debt monetization producing significant inflation. Unlike technical defaults where payments are merely delayed, this default would be much larger and would reverberate across the U.S. and world economies, end quote. And this report stated that this prediction was really based on like a positive assumption that people are going to continue spending and believing that the economy is going to get better. But if they don't, then the debt dynamics are going to make that 20-year window a hell of a lot shorter. And so how does the Biden administration plan to get us out of this mess and lower our debt? The same way they always do, by fucking over the American people and raising taxes, which they're referring to as, quote, tax reform. So Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen made no secret of this recently when she said that the way to fix our debt problem is to collect more taxes. And Business Insider also reported that our borrowing is approaching levels of economic distress and our ballooning debt will likely force the Federal Reserve to create even higher interest rates, which were already at an all-time high. So if you think the economy is going to get better, like stand by, because we are about to get taxed even more and interest rates are going to go up even more. And one of these predictions was like 40% of your paycheck is going to go to interest rates. 
Okay, we need to do like a whole episode on the Federal Reserve and all the conspiracies with that because this is just getting ridiculous. I think I saw a video where they were comparing the interest rate now from like whatever, like when Trump was in office and it was like you could go and buy a $300,000 house when Trump was in office for the same monthly uh, mortgage payment as a $700,000 house now because of the interest rate going up. Like it's insane. And I mean, we're already paying a fortune in taxes when you look at like the tax of inflation, like prices of gas, basic groceries. I mean, we talk about this all the time. Um, My daughter the other day, my 14 year old, she was going through her baby book and there was a page in there where I wrote like the price of like milk, bread, gas, 2009 man we were living large <laughs> it was like gas was like 250 and like bread was like a dollar something i'm like holy crap things have really gotten out of control no. um but biden has done nothing but fuck this country from the cost of everything going through the roof to the open border to looking weak on the world stage and okay did you see the cringy 60 minutes interview with him I didn't see the whole thing. No. Okay. Well, I'm just going to show a really brief clip. Um, So basically like throughout the interview, the interviewer, like he was answering the questions for him. Like we want to hear from him, like not the interviewer. Right. And in do this we, clip, though? Do we, we don't we want, want to hear from either one of them really. <laughs> uh, but once again, he couldn't even keep his eyes open. Like I'm not kidding. He was talking with his eyes closed um, for most of the interview. And this clip, the interviewer asked him if he's sure, if he's really sure that he wants to run again. And Biden starts to basically list everything that Trump accomplished, but like as something that he did. So it's very like, it's just very eye opening. So listen to this. Sure that you want to run again. Yes, because I'm sure. Look. And I really said the world's at an inflection point. The world's changing. But we have an opportunity to make it. So imagine if we were able to succeed in getting the Middle East put in place where we have normalization of relations. I think we can do that. Imagine what happens if we, in fact, unite all of Europe and Putin is finally put down where he cannot cause the kind of trouble he's been causing. We have an enormous opportunity. I don't even know if you could hear that because he mumbled the oh, yeah. whole time. <laughs> That's why, like, if if for those of you who are listening, you didn't see my face, but it's it wasn't that I couldn't hear the clip. It's that I couldn't understand what the fuck he was saying. Yeah. I mean, like they need, you know, captions because you can't you can't understand anything. Mumbles. But like basically what he was saying is like. Yeah, I want to run again because like, look, we had an opportunity um, to be in a position where, you know, Putin wasn't going to run amok or whatever he said. And, um, the middle we East, did. we did the, until the middle East, right. And then he's like in the middle East, like had a opportunity for peace. Yeah. Th- that's where we were. <laughs> Trump did that. Trump kept Putin at bay, kept China at bay, North Korea. There was peace in the middle East. That's what you had. And instead of just sitting back and like keeping that, you took every step possible to undo all of it. And now look at where we are. But it's like he's so far gone. He doesn't even realize that. Like he has no idea. Like he single handedly like caused all of this um, with his poor policy decisions. I mean, we talk about this all the time, how everyone sees this weakness and they're taking advantage of it. And it's like, look at where we are from that to where we are now in less than three years. And it's just like, I feel like it's very purposeful. Like he's compromised. I mean, we talk about that all the time, but in case anyone still does not realize that he's compromised, here's some more proof that just came to light. So they're, they actually have a personal check now from Jim Biden, his brother to Joe Biden for $200,000. The same exact day that Jim Biden received the same amount, $200,000, 
from a company called AmeriCare, which was a failing business that provided rural health care. So this business that's like failing just happened to get $200,000 put into their account. And then they paid it to Jim Biden in the same day. And then that same day, Jim Biden wrote a personal check to Joe Biden. It's like this. I don't know. I mean, I don't know a lot about this stuff, but it appears to be a classic case of money laundering. And it's not that we needed any more evidence, but I mean, for all the Democrats that said his name is not on any of the checks, well, here you go. His name is on it. He can't keep hiding behind his family members and his grandkids that received money on his behalf. So my question is, like, what did he do for that $200,000? What did he do for the $20 million that his family received from various adversaries across, you know, the world? But our Congress can't even get their shit together to pass a budget. So figuring this out is out of the question. But it's like, look at where we are now in the world. And is anyone else like not seeing that he received all of this money clearly for a reason? And were all of these actions that he did purposeful to get us in the situation we are in now, which is a complete disaster? Yeah, well, here's something else that came out this past week. I don't know if you saw this, but there was an article in the Daily Mail. And like first it was talking about how, you know, Biden's been in office for a thousand days and like 300 of those he's been on vacation and he's like spent them at his summer home in Delaware. And so he purchased that summer home for approximately 2.7 million in cash. And he just happened to purchase the home at the same time that Hunter Biden was working on that shady deal with Henry Zhao at the CEFC back in 2017. And so property records are showing that Joe Biden's home was purchased on June 8th in 2017, which is, again, the same time Hunter was apparently like sending these threatening text messages to Zhao about not fulfilling his commitment on their deal. And like there's if you you go online, you can look at all these text messages. I think it was through WhatsApp. And so that's weird, right? Yep. And James Comer, the chairman of the House Oversight Committee, definitely seems to think so because he did an interview with the Daily Mail and he stated, quote, the fact that Joe Biden purchased a luxurious beach house around the same time his family was receiving millions from a CCP linked company raises many questions that need to be answered. The House Oversight Committee will continue to follow the money trail to determine the extent of President Biden's involvement in his family's influence peddling schemes and its impact on our national security. End quote. Senator Ron Johnson, who was one of the main senators investigating Hunter Biden's shady foreign business dealings with Chuck Grassley, he also told the Daily Mail, quote, the corruption of the Biden crime family has been obvious for years. This is just another piece of evidence that will probably be ignored once again by most of the mainstream media. It also underscores the imperative of obtaining all the bank records from all the Bidens who have benefited from Joe and Hunter's grifts. Okay, really quick. My conspiracy mind is like going crazy right now, but they're doing all these investigations. They're finding, they, I mean, they have the evidence now to prove all this stuff, right? But they can't do anything because the house is in complete disarray. Right. So all these people that are not voting for Jim Jordan or whoever, um, you know, are likely part of the Uniparty. And maybe that's the whole plan. Maybe they're going to try to like have this go as long as possible, knowing that once the house resumes normal function, Biden's done. And so yeah. they're going to keep trying to keep everything in disarray until the election. Yeah, because Biden could just do, you know, executive order decisions to keep sending mm -hmm. money to Ukraine yep. and wherever else he wants to send it. And we can continue to keep the house a total fucking clown show. And all this stuff that keeps coming up, these are all, all these investigations are being done by the House Oversight Committee. So if the House can't do anything, you're exactly right. Like nothing's going to happen. Yeah. So and another interesting thing, though, that this article mentioned was like, you know how from like day one, the White House has like very vehemently denied that Biden was ever involved in business dealings with Hunter. And apparently, I guess now White House aides have stopped claiming that Biden never spoke to his son about his business dealings. Isn't that interesting? And this article also referenced an incident that happened last year. And I don't remember this. Maybe you do. But there were like major discrepancies being shown in how Joe Biden reported his taxes. 
um, it was between 2017 and 2019. And he and Jill Biden reported like $16.5 million of gross income on their federal tax returns, which supposedly was money earned from like book sales and speaking engagements. Like, I don't know who earns that much from fucking book deals, but publisher, were- not the author. <laughs> yeah, not the author. <laughs> but there was an office of government ethics filing that they had to do for the same period. And they only reported $9.6 million. So there's this discrepancy of like $5.2 million. And Jill Biden was claiming that that $5.2 million was from her teaching job at Northern Virginia Community College and from a salary that she paid herself from one of her companies, which were not required to be reported to the Office of Government Ethics. And I don't know what the fuck kind of teacher makes that kind of money teaching at a community college, because when I was teaching at a local community college about 15 years ago, I think I made maybe 20 bucks an hour. So clearly I was teaching at the wrong college. I don't think that the tenured professors at Ivy League universities even make that much. So come on. (laughs) Right. (laughs) And then apparently this 5.2 million is still unaccounted for. And according to information received by an FBI informant, quote, this figure is surprisingly similar, end quote, to the $5 million that Joe Biden was allegedly given by um, Mikola Cholewski, I totally probably pronounced that wrong, but this was the, the owner of Burisma and that whole, you know, bribery scheme where the informant claimed that Joe and Hunter each received 5 million through their like fucking offshore accounts. So again, how much more evidence do we need? Like, I'm so sick of the zero accountability for the fucking Biden crime family. And every week there's new evidence every single uh, week, yeah. something new comes up. <laughs> right. Meanwhile, Trump is charged left and right for the same things that the Democrats do, like denying the election. I mean, Hillary Clinton is still denying, you know, the election. Um, And so with him, it is it's like a double standard. And I think that's what bothers me the most. It's like I get that the government is slow with things. But if that were Trump, he would have been locked up and the key would have been thrown away and his whole family would have been locked up. So. Just to give a little update on him, you have this U.S. District Judge, uh, Tanya Chutkin. And first of all, this woman was the the January 6th judge. She was like known for being incredibly harsh on the J6 defendants. And she's clearly biased. So while all this stuff was happening in Israel, she placed a narrow gag order on Trump that barred him from making public statements targeting prosecutors, court staff, and potential witnesses. And this was the most serious restriction that a court has placed on him. So in a filing, his Trump's lawyers said, quote, no court in American history has imposed a gag order on a criminal defendant who is campaigning for public office, least of all on the leading candidate for president of the United States, end quote. And the federal judge overseeing Trump's 2020 election interference case agreed to temporarily lift the gag order. So this would give Trump's uh, lawyers time to prove like why um, his comments shouldn't be restricted as the case heads towards trial. I mean, what the fuck? I don't think there should ever be a gag order on someone campaigning for public office, let alone president of the United States. Like, this is where it's really scary because this is the type of thing that happens in third world corrupt nations. And what it's doing is setting a precedent that we don't want in this country. And for all the Trump haters out there, like this has set the precedent. So now if your person is in that situation, you're not going to like it very much. It's like people have to look at the big picture here. And so once again, I feel like free speech is at risk. And this clearly biased judge has just taken it to a whole new level. And so speaking of free speech, the Supreme Court on Friday lifted the restrictions that they had put in place on the Biden administration's communication with social media companies. So there's a lawsuit that is targeting the government's efforts to combat online misinformation. And while that's going on, uh, the Supreme Court said that they're going to lift all of those restrictions. So basically what that means is the Biden administration gets to continue doing whatever they want with social media companies spreading propaganda, censoring Americans that, you know, don't agree with their narrative, 
until this lawsuit is over. And who knows how long that'll play out. So yeah, free speech again, up for grabs. Yeah, it only it only applies when it has to do with Trump or yeah. the MAGA, the MAGA extremists. And right. then there's speech, but for everybody else, like do what you want. Exactly. Exactly. But since it's Monday, I want to end the episode on a positive note, which is that two U.S. hostages were released from Hamas. Uh, it was a woman and her mother that are from the Chicago area, and they were released from Gaza and they're going to be OK. And so hopefully this is a good sign and we'll see the remaining hostages released. So stay hopeful for that. So, yay, we ended an episode on a on a positive note. We're doing good here. Uh, who knows what will happen the rest of 30 the minutes of negativity followed by <laughs> yeah. 10 seconds of positive comment. <laughs> One little positive blip at the end. Yeah. All right. Well, everyone have a great week and we'll see you back here on Wednesday. Thanks for tuning in. If you're sick of all the crazy shit going on in our country and you want to express your support and patriotism for the show, head on over to our Etsy store at UO Patriot Chicks and check out our new stickers. The link can also be found on our website. If you love the show and you want exclusive episodes, support the podcast and join the conversation by becoming a member of our Patreon community. We'll be posting weekly member-only podcast episodes and content that isn't available on the weekly podcast. Every Patreon member will also get a free unapologetically outspoken sticker and updates about our new sticker release before they're made public. And be sure to follow us on TikTok at unapologetically outspoken. And if you haven't done so already, please rate and review the podcast. The more you support us, the more people we can reach. So help us spread the word. 